Hey guys, and welcome. Thank you so much for stopping by. I just wanted to let you guys know something. For the last three days, I've been feeling pretty ill. And I'd rather make you guys a quality video than a badly made one. I appreciate that you all come here to predominantly listen to me. And I am so profoundly grateful for that. But please understand that I need time to rest and recover to continue making the content that you enjoy. I'm hoping to have a video on human trafficking tomorrow done by me, so look out for that. But in the meantime, I hope you can enjoy this fantastic narration by Mother Creepypasta. I love deep sea stories, and I can't express how amazing this story and her narrations are. I suppose that the best way for you guys to find out is to listen for yourselves. So get comfortable and let the darkness take control. The ocean has its silent caves, deep, deep, quiet, and alone. Though there be fury in the waves, beneath them there is none. Over the course of the last few weeks of training, I'd memorized nearly every facet of the Tuscany. Every dial and every readout, and every knob and screen and nuance of structure. And the quality of the personal submarine's craftsmanship never ceased to astound me. It was a remarkable feat of engineering, this little beast. Designed with such care that even the equipment on the whole could withstand more water pressure than the sea could muster up at any achievable depth. It was my Pegasus, my Trojan horse, my very own Apollo 11. And inside this matrix of layered syntactic foam, I would follow the ballast to the gratuitous and unexplored depths of Higgins' maw. I began the separation sequence, and the deep diver fell away from the escort and dipped beneath the surface of the Pacific with silence and grace, and a few knots of speed. And then... I was consumed in a whole new world, albeit one I'd frequented, that of the sea. Schools of fish swam on by me, and when their cloud passed through a sunbeam, it glinted silver, and beneath them swam rays that rolled their wings to the beat of the current, and out in the rocks crawled the crustaceans, and sat the plant life that spruced up all the whitewashed stones there like holiday ornaments. But I had an appointment to keep and the oxygen tank was a demanding clock. So I dove right on past the old reef and out into the open waters where the seabed couldn't be seen for many, many miles yet. The maw, Reuben had said. 50,000 feet below the surface, Booker. 50,000. Do you know what that means? Means it's a whole hell of a lot deeper down than the Challenger Abyss. He nodded at that. Are you ready to make history? Was I? I thought I was. I'd prepared for this lonely dive and nothing else for some years now. It was the culmination of a lifetime of work and study in the field. And so tight was its grip on my mind that I often dreamt of it in my sleep, of what I'd find at the bottom, and what it would mean, and what monstrous things might take offense to my presence there. No, no. I shoved the thought aside. Tuscany was all the protection I needed in that regard. It offered technology on the bleeding edge in lieu of a heavy hull, and that was enough to withstand enough water pressure to crush bones beneath skin and inches of steel. What animal had jaws more powerful than the ocean itself at Fathom? So, I hit the thrusters, and down I went, like a bullet to the pinch. I eyed the depth meter as much as I did the sea. 100 feet. 200. Sharks and turtles and uncountable fish swept past me. 300 feet. 500 feet. 700 feet. 1,000. 1,250. The inverse height of the Empire State Building. 1,500. 16. The water began to blur and grain up and darken as the sunlight struggled to push on through. 2,000. 25. 3,000. 32, where the light no longer shines. And soon, all the light I had to spill to the path ahead and down were the lights of the Tuscany. 
I continued the descent for hours. The pressure meter ticked up in spasmic bursts, but up it went. Up, up, up. Soon, ticking past the point where the weight of the sea would have crushed the steel of another vessel. One mile down. 1.3, 1.6, where even sperm whales hit their lowest dive. I could now claim with confidence that no mammal on earth was as deep down at that very moment as myself. And still I dove. Two miles. 2.1. 2.2. The water was as black as space now, except for where the lights of the Tuscany pierced through it and the thickness of the fluid make it look like ink or oil or some kind of alien sludge that smeared up against the reinforced windows and slimed its way across the hull. Things were tight down here, despite the vastness of it all. Yet, still I dove. 13,000 feet. The abyssal zone. Pressure stands at 11,000 psi. I saw an anglerfish float by, and it was startled by the sheer volume of light spread by the Tuscany that dwarfed its own bioluminescent glow. It swam away, and I dove further. 15,000 feet. 3 miles. 3.1. Now things get interesting. Mankind had visited these depths almost infrequently enough to count the expeditions on a single pair of hands. I was now ranked among an illustrious few explorers, and although I wasn't the first to hit these marks, I'd hit the deepest one yet before the journey was over. I was determined, and I was capable. So I checked the depth chart. 16,281.4 feet, nearly halfway to the world record. The Tuscany continued its dive. 20,000 feet down, the Hadal Zone. Pressure here is 1,100 times what it is at the surface. 22,000 feet. 26. 29,000, the height of Mount Everest. 30. 30.5. 30 31,000, the same distance from the surface as a commercial airliner at the peak of its flight. The Challenger Deep what had previously been the lowest recorded place on the seabed, sat at roughly 36,000 feet below the surface in the depths of the Mariana Trench. No light from the sun had ever come close, and to the best accounts, life existed there, but only sparsely, and the pressure is unspeakable. But I was going somewhere vastly deeper. All we know is we found a canyon, Reuben had said. Dwarfs the Grand, sitting dead center in the Pacific seabed, about 1,200 kilometers west of Hawaii and another 900 south, and, near as we can figure, some 50,000 straight on down. 36,000 feet. I was now tied for the world record. 50,000 feet? Why the hell are we just now seeing it? 36.5. I did it. My heartbeat swept up to a faster rhythm. I was officially a world record holder. No human being in recorded history had been as deep below the surface as I was at that very moment. New seabed scanning technology helped. It gave us a more detailed topographical map of the hydrosphere than we've ever had before. And once we got the results back, we took a look, and there it was, just waiting for us, inviting us down. 37. So what's down there? 37.3 Hell, Doctor, if we knew that, we wouldn't be sending you, would we? 37.9 I suppose not. 38. 38.5 The awful spirits of the deep hold their communion there, and there are those for whom we weep. The young, the bright, the fair. Higgins Ma, according to the best information available to me at the time of departure, is a pit roughly a full kilometer across. It begins at approximately 46,000 feet below the surface, and it is estimated to bottom out at Higgins Deep, a small valley that sits at its base, some 5,000 additional feet below that. The Maw is the largest and deepest such formation in the hydrosphere, and yet its dimensions and location are the only things concretely known about it. 
That, of course, is where myself and where the Tuscany come in. 43,000 feet down. I hit the floodlights underneath the Tuscany, and the glow washed over an alien landscape that likely hadn't been seen in over a billion years. There were mountains here. Mountains. Ones that rivaled the Alps, and wild arches and plateaus that stretched far off to a murky horizon before being shrouded by seawater. I even saw life down here in the depths. A squid-like thing of simply monstrous size swam on by my boat. It stopped for a moment, and during that moment, I thought it might take offense to me. But after looking hard at the Tuscany and brushing a tentacle down the port side, it swam off in search of other things. Atta girl. I descended further. 44,000 feet. 45. And then, all of a sudden, there it was. The maw. My mouth hung by the jaw as the sheer scope of the beast came into view. It was a breathtaking sight to behold. A monstrously large and equally dark hole in the crust of the earth that plummeted to inconceivable fathoms. I descended a bit further. 45.5. 46,000 feet, and Tuscany fell into its yawn. Somehow, things were even blacker in the depths of the thing, even though sunlight had long since blotted out. 46.5. 47. 47.2. I began to become aware of a low current pulling me downward. It wasn't particularly powerful, but it was unexpected, and it was therefore alarming. And yet, I couldn't bear to pull myself back up. Not yet. I'll turn around if it gets bad. So, down I went, deeper and deeper and deeper still into the cavern. 48,000 feet, 48.5, 49, 49.1, and then I saw it, a glow. I squinted and dimmed my lights to confirm the intuition. What in the name of God? It was there indeed, a dim reddish purple, then green then purple again, and then blue, floating on a mist of current some few thousand feet below. I resumed the dive to chase it. 49.5, 49.7, The glow, whatever it was, was getting deeper and wider and brighter. Soon, it filled up the whole path down and ahead. I dimmed the Tuscany's underlights to their lowest setting, and by 50,000 feet, I could see that the glow was coming from somewhere not directly beneath me, but off to the side and around a wide corner. This cave isn't a straight pit. And sure enough, the hole bottomed out here, and then opened up to its left. Holy God. Holy God. It was a cavern chamber, at least a full square kilometer and only the enormity of its radius maintained the darkness of it despite the presence of thousands of floating bioluminescent ponds that pulsed purple and green and blue and red and dimmed into the interim. I took the Tuscany in deeper, and her cameras were to life. Calmly, the wearied seamen rest beneath their own blue sea. The ocean solitudes are blessed, for there is purity. The cavern became darker still when the pods faded into the water behind the ship, but there were more things to be seen here than rocks. Tuscany, about a quarter hour after entering the chamber, soon floated on by a bizarrely rope-like plant of utterly impossible size, one that appeared to stretch nearly across the height of the cave and grew wider at the base, although the bottom of it was shrouded in darkness. I took the submarine in for a closer inspection, and hit her lights to the fullest setting. My heartbeat slammed. There were suction cups on it. Each one was as big as the Tuscany herself, and they writhed and pulsed across and down the full length of what was now very clearly a tentacle. In a panic, I shoved Tuscany back and away from the thing. But when I tried to turn her around, the base of the hole collided with the beast and stuck fast to one of the cups. 
I gunned the thrusters and could hear a wet tearing sound as the machine ripped itself free from the cup's grasp. But then, the tentacle came to life. It whipped and whirled and smacked around the cavern and pressed itself to the roof, and then it fell down, deep beyond where the darkness blanketed the floor. Come on, baby. I hit the thrusters again, and Tuscany rocketed off the way it came through the darkness and off towards the ponds, whose glow I hoped would afford me an opportunity to shut the lights of the ship and make my escape. If I were so lucky. But very soon, I began to hear and feel the movement of something unspeakably titanic rolling across the floor of the chamber. It rumbled and thundered and shuddered and shook, and soon clouds of dirt and rock flew up out of the black pitch and blanketed the view forward and I could hear boulders smack against the ceiling of the cave before sinking again to where they'd been. The sound had erupted across the entire breadth of the cave at once. My eardrums nearly burst, and likely would have, had it not been for muffling of the explosion provided by the walls of the Tuscany. The submarine shook too, but she held her integrity well enough for me to fly on past the floating pods, some of which were now knocked about on their sides and rolling, and back towards the yawning mouth of the tunnel that would take me back out into the open deep sea. The Tuscany buckled and rolled with an impact. The tentacle, I realized, had shot up from the ground and hit the bottom of the ship between her ballasts. But luckily, it knocked her with a force up towards the tunnel. I rolled Tuscany with the hit and managed to regain some control, and I boosted the thrusters into the turn and up again, now back into the maw. Then I began to climb. 52,000 feet. 51. 51.5. 51. So what's down there? Come on, baby, come on. Don't you fail me now. Don't you fucking fail me now. Hell, Doctor, if we knew that, we wouldn't be sending you, would we? 50.5. 50. 49.9. 49.6. 49, Tuscany ascended with panic speed, and all the while she did it, I could feel the rumbling of the tentacle's pursuit and the walls of the pit. It smashed its way on through the tunnel and whipped and thrashed, but Tuscany was too quick a runner. 47.5, 47, 46.8, 46.4, 46,000 feet and climbing high. I suppose not. Tuscany burst out of the maw and was about to rocket straight on back up to the surface, but then the tentacle flew out beside her and nearly smashed in her front window. I bent the controls to the edge of their set casing, and Tuscany tanked to the left and up a bit and missed the ground by inches. I hit the lights again to navigate the labyrinth of rocks as I struggled to remount the climb. But in the light of the ship, I saw it. These weren't rocks after all. They were other ships. Massive vessels, imperial warships from ages past, bent and crooked and broken at the bottom of the sea pulled down here by whatever it was that now threw its back to my devouring. The tentacle smashed along behind me. Mainmasts and battlements and flat decks and rusted iron and wooden bolt holes were splintered up and tossed to the winds of the sea, never again to reconvene. I took Tuscany through this nautical graveyard with far, far too much speed for my safety. Under ship towers we went, and through cannon mounts and past the blades of dead engines and around rudders. The cacophony of my flight and the destruction path set by my hunter awoke the life in the place. Fish washed out of holes and cabins and captain's quarters and deep deck stair flights and soon joined me in my effort to escape. But it seemed there was no escape to be found here. The entire ground for countless miles shook and rumbled with seismic force. It was thunderously loud and it picked up speed and violence with time. Tuscany finally flew up to miss a splintered crow's nest atop the mast by less than a foot, and finally used that directed momentum to put away distance between the seabed and herself with as many knots of speed as her thrusters would allow without bursting from the effort. The depth chart began to rise. 45.9, 45 45.2, 45 45,000 feet, 44.8. Come on, you motherfucker!
the water itself seemed to shift the sound. And then, out of nowhere, Tuscany was no longer the only thing spilling light to the abyss. An orange glow flashed across the sea, and for an instant illuminated nearly the entirety of its vastness. Then it blinked, and then flicked on again and stayed active. I shut off Tuscany's lights to preserve every molecule of power for the ascent. 44 2, 44, 43 7. Beside me in the glow, I could make out other creatures retreating too, ones of spectacular size, again, that mankind had never cataloged, and that I sadly would not have time to. There were bus sized shaped manta ray things, wrapped up in cloud wisps of transparent jelly, and even that squid the size of a building, all flying upwards in mass panic. And I led the charge. 43 1, 42 8, 42 3, 42. I looked behind me and down through the rear window. The maw had moved. It was alive. God almighty, I was in the leviathan's throat. I was in its fucking throat. I saw its tentacle tongue lash out of the maw and collect enough fish to feed a small town. Tuscany rocketed ever upwards as the leviathan whipped even larger tentacles behind it and gained speed with the force of a hurricane. The leviathan opened its maw yet again and spewed forth its tentacle tongue. And with it, it whipped up several Olympic swimming pools worth of water into a gale force maelstrom. The mammoth squid was caught in its fury, and then it vanished into the pit forever when the moss snapped shut with a thunderous, echoing snap. Tuscany, meanwhile, continued to rocket upwards and managed to escape the whirlpool by a foot. 39 5, 39, 38 7, 38 2. 38,000 feet and climbing, but the leviathan pursued me relentlessly, riding on the flood of its own current. Its tentacles, each dozens of feet across and a mile long, beat the water back and tried to gain speed for their host. 37, 5, 37, 36, 4. Tuscany had proved her worth with speed, and the pressure gauge now fell in jumps. It remained in the red, and would for some time, but it was falling steadily, even as the depth chart rose. 29,000 feet. 28,3. 27,5. But the Leviathan hadn't given up the chase. Not yet. I could feel it doubling its efforts. The displaced water rocked the Tuscany, and she buckled and rolled in the synthetic current. Then, I heard the maw open up behind me and the water begin to whip and swirl itself into a frenzy by the ocean load. I punched the thrusters to the breaking point. The encasing syntactic foam was pressed to its limits. The reinforced glass began to chip ever so slightly, but the chips broke into cracks, and those cracks began to crawl across the width of the windows. I checked the gauges. 20,000 feet. 19,8. 19-4, 19-3, the ascent was slowing. Come on, baby, come on, come on, come on, come on, please, God, please, God, be with me, be- In the orange glow of the Leviathan's eyes, I could see how quickly the water was slipping by Tuscany and getting swept up into the maelstrom. The submarine began to sway port to starboard and shudder and shake. 17-4. 17,000, 16, 9, 16, 3, 16, 1, 16, I watched the gauge with a nauseating desperation. 15, 9, 5, 15, 9, 2. I could feel her slowing to a crawl. Come on, come on, come on. 15, 9, 2, 5, 15, 9, 4, 15, 9, 6. Shit! And that was it. Tuscany was caught, and no sooner did the depth chart begin to slip than did I feel the whole submarine lose all sense of control and tumble backwards and around. I was thrown out of my seat and smacked my nose against the roof of the pilot sphere. Blood exploded and it drenched my shirt and sprayed the glass and the entirety of the control set. 
I grabbed my face and began to apply pressure to slow the blood loss. But Tuscany again flipped ballast over ballast to starboard in the whirlpool and spilled me into the hatch ladder. I felt my shoulder dislocate and my kneecap smack into the bottom rung. My head swam, and still Tuscany tumbled backwards. The cracks on the window spread faster. 16-3. 16-4. I could smell the inside of the maw through the hull of the ship. But then, all at once, and not a moment too soon, I got an idea. It wasn't a particularly good one. But hell if it wasn't better than nothing. I managed to limp and tumble my way to the controls and grip the handles as the ship rolled. Wait for it. Wait for it. Now! The sound of the roar was so close, every last control surface in the sphere rattled in its case. My eardrums rattled too. But then I flared up the thrusters again, full blast and at an angle. And the Tuscany shuddered and flipped and shook and with fortune, fell straight out of the maelstrom, with inches to spare. I felt the edge of the leviathan's maw graze the starboard side, and the impact again sent me into the roof while the ship rolled end over end over end again. I smacked my ribs up on a dip in the alcove and fell back down into the seat, head first, and then out onto the floor. I managed to right myself with my good arm and get my bearings. I was free, but only just. The Tuscany banked and tumbled again and rolled. Slower now in the absence of the whirlpool's flood current, but not yet in control of its pole. I tried to steer away, but it was useless. The ship flipped around the back of the Leviathan's titanic maw and up over its head as the beast flew on by underneath me like a freight train. And for the first time since catching the monster's eye, I began to fully appreciate the magnitude of its size. Its back was an endless, snake-like and sharp fin spine the size of a minor mountain range. And only quick maneuvering moved Tuscany away from the jagged back fins that chugged up towards me and sliced open the sea itself. They missed me by feet and the blast of the current they'd swept up sent the submarine reeling backwards, off a bit further, and into relative safety. I quickly dimmed the lights to their lowest setting and caught my breath, as the full form of the Leviathan washed on past me. It stretched far away into the abyss below for well over a mile, and dragging away behind it were thousands upon thousands of tentacles, a forest of the things, each the size of a six-lane highway and tipped with razor-sharp hooks and a flurry of wing fins. It took a full three minutes for the beast to pass by me fully, and then it curved around in the other direction and swam off in search of other things to devour. The form soon slipped away into the shadow, and then it was gone. I surfaced hours later, having allowed the battered Tuscany to take its time with the journey. She was solely responsible for my escape, my quick thinking be damned. A marvel of engineering indeed. Once I did break the surface, I dispersed a distress beacon and then promptly collapsed from exhaustion. Evidently, I was picked up by the Coast Guard some hours after that, a few hundred miles southwest of Hawaii, and pulled from the near wreckage of my submarine and taken to a hospital on the mainland. It was there I woke up a full day later. As I recovered, I heard some isolated chatter of tremendous seismic activity near where I'd been and how the whole ocean floor had changed and moved and shifted form. But I couldn't care less. I told the bastards what I knew. And on top of that, they have the Tuscany, and they have all the recorded evidence. And you now have this written account. What everyone does with this information now is entirely up to them. All I know is that I won't be doing any more diving anytime soon. I've come to a realization that mankind has more than enough space to expand throughout and live upon and thrive in above and near the surface and on land and in the skies, and soon, hopefully, out there amongst the stars. 
but there are things in the sea that hold ownership of the deep, and perhaps it's best to leave it that way, for all of our sakes. The earth has guilt, the earth has care, unquiet are its graves, but peaceful sleep is ever there, beneath the dark blue waves. The USS District of Columbia deployed its cargo, a two-man Eisenhower-class Navy stealth sub called Agincourt, on which I served as navigator alongside Engineer Lavelle, and once it was loose, it slipped away into the Pacific and began to part with its escort. The sea was in shambles here. There were dead fish and splintered boat holes floating in the current. But it was far from unexpected. It was recently estimated, in fact, that since the Leviathan woke some months ago, it has critically disrupted over 400 trillion cubic tons of water and all the life therein and was becoming a potential threat to shipping lanes as well as naval operations. It has been classified for these reasons, and others, as a severe national security threat. And so, the Navy built the Agincourt on Tuscany's blueprint and selected Lavelle and myself to man it, and then instructed the pair of us to hunt down the Leviathan and lure it up from the deep so the District of Columbia could move in for a swift kill without exposing herself in the chase. For some hours after we entered the sea, there was little else but quiet there and the hulking mass of the District of Columbia as it followed. But then even that faded into the seawater, and when it did, Lavelle and I found ourselves alone in the midst of the ocean. He descended the hatch ladder from the operation center and joined me for a moment in the sphere. So, Latner, you're the nav. How do you plan on finding this thing in the middle of the ocean? I'm already tracking it. You see that? I pointed up at a corridor of seawater that was moving north and that carried on for miles. We'd been following it for some time. Lavelle pursed his lips. Didn't realize there was a draft that big out there. There wasn't until earlier this morning. That leviathan swam on down this way a few hours ago, and it left this as a little present for the two of us. Well then, we'll be sure to thank it. How much longer before we see the damn thing? Not long. Look at those fish. I nodded toward a school of the things. You ever see anything like that? He shook his head. They looked panicked. And they're swimming towards us for a reason. Closer we get, more we'll see. Just wait. And we did. What started as an isolated school of fish soon became several, and then the nautical retreat boiled over in scale and number into a mammoth, seething cloud of life, all whirled up into a frenzy and pushing desperately south against the riptide, like birds from a storm cloud or the onset of winter. The two of us said not a word until the crowd broke and Agincourt again found itself floating in the open and quiet sea. And then I brought Agincourt to a full stop, and Lavelle said, Holy God. Ahead of us, not more than two miles off, was a titanic mass of shadow, unmoving and so breathtakingly huge that not even all its edges could be fully seen. It was the Leviathan. Blue whales and dinosaurs themselves paled in comparison to this monstrous, mountainous thing. And as Lavelle and I sat and stared at it, it made its first move. A turn away into the depths behind it, followed by a sharp dive. In doing so, of course, the silhouette of its full form came into view, and the sight of it stole the breath right from our lungs. We couldn't have said a word that moment even if we'd known the words to say. We simply stared out at the thing and did our unworthy best to appreciate the magnitude of its vastness. It was as long as they said it was, an enormous slithering serpent thing, whose tail broke into a thousand other tails that drifted and curled and dragged lazily behind it and fell deep away into the blackness. But seeing it in person was altogether a new experience. Before saying another word to me, Lavelle hopped back to the ladder and climbed up to the operations room. Agincourt to District of Columbia. This is Lieutenant Lavelle. We've located the Leviathan. 
33.934 by negative 153.4570. We're given chase, but it's moving fast, and it's moving down. Look to the riptide. Advise that district follow our mark, but stand by to engage until we've brought it back up to you. I gunned the thrusters as he spoke and followed the slipping shadow away into the deep. Twelve knots of speed. Twelve point two. Twelve point four. Agincourt crawled and then cruised. And then ran with all haste in pursuit of a monster. Lavelle came down the hatch ladder a few minutes later. District is en route. Making speed? She's moving, but she's not coming out into the open until we've got this fucker where she wants it. Any ideas on that front? A moment passed before I said, You seen the footage from Tuscany? Bits and pieces, yeah. Well, the pilot caught the Leviathan's attention, and it chased him straight up to the surface. But he made it, didn't he? Yeah, by the skin of his teeth from what I hear. Gave up deep diving altogether. What's your point? Point is, Agincourt's faster than Tuscany. If we can get the thing to chase us, we can outrun it, and then get District on its flanks. Couple of torpedoes to her side, and boom. We have ourselves a 300,000 ton museum piece. There was another pause, and then Lavelle broke it with the worst question of all. And what if District can't put a dent in that thing? You saw how big it is. Well then, I suppose we'll need to find another ride home. The Agincourt filled up her ballast and followed the Leviathan down into the depths of the Pacific, past where the water stopped the sunbeams at the gate. And before long, all that could be seen was nothing at all. From that point forward, it was the boat's humble capacity for sonar that kept us moving in the right direction, with an occasional nudge from the monster's own flood current. Lavelle broke a long silence. What's the plan? At the moment, I'm just trying to get the damn thing's attention. The closer we are to District when it notices us, the better. But as it stands, we're getting in too deep. Way too deep. And we were. By the depth chart, we just passed 15,000 feet. And we needed to get things turned around. Go ahead and strap yourself in. He did, in the passenger's chair behind mine. And then I hit the front lights and gunned the thrusters. What the hell are you doing? Like I said, I'm getting its attention. But then I stopped and eased back on the thrusters. The lights of the Agincourt spilled their glow to the hole of the abyss. And they found it empty. Where the hell did it go? I dialed up the brightness of the lights and brought the boat to a full stop. I don't know. We scanned the water for hints of movement or shadow, but there was no movement and there was nothing but shadow and silence. I moved Agincourt from a rest to a light cruising speed, and her searchlights swept and swooped and cast themselves to rocks. Nothing. Damn. Unless... I hit the lights. Now what? What is it? There's no way in hell something that big just disappeared. So where did it go? I blew the ballast and adjusted Agincourt's heading for the surface, and then I gunned the thrusters harder than ever. It didn't go anywhere. It knew we were here all along. It just dragged us down into the dark to shake our tail. What? A thing that size is afraid of being hunted? It's not being hunted. We are. Agincourt lifted herself up through the water with as much speed as she could muster up for the running, but time was against us. Up ahead we saw the shadow of a titan moving fast to block off our escape. It was a difference in shade between deep twilight and midnight black. We've got to move. See if you can raise the district. Lavelle unbuckled his seatbelt and flew into the hatch ladder and climbed it two rungs at a time. And not a moment later, I heard the static of the radio as he lifted a hail. Hello, hello, District of Columbia, this is Agincourt. Can you read me? Over. Static, audible even in the pilot sphere. The sheer bulk of the Leviathan was blocking the signal. Keep trying to raise the escort, I'm going to get out from under this thing and clear the way. Hello, hello, District of Columbia, this is Lieutenant Lavelle of the Agincourt. Can you read me? Over. 
Agincourt banked hard over to her starboard flank, and I allotted her all speed for the escape. Seventeen knots flat. Seventeen point three. Seventeen point five. Seventeen seven. I looked up. The leviathan's shadow bathed the whole seabed in its mass. Still we ran. Hello, hello, District of Columbia. This is the USS Agincourt. Can you hear me? Over. More static. 19 knots. 19.2. 19.4. Agincourt was moving faster than most vessels already, and yet the shadow above us had not struggled at all to keep us within perimeter. So big was its source. 21 knots. District of Columbia, this is Agincourt. Can you read me? Over. Respond. Still nothing. 21.9. 22-2. I looked up. The shadow was murky and ill-defined, but I could make out the monstrous, alien forest of its mighty tentacles, which wrapped and curled and spread out on all directions in the absence of movement. It looked like a black star seen through a bent lens of time, but it was slipping back behind us. Agincourt was more than a match for speed. 23-5. Hello, District of Columbia. This is Lieutenant Lavelle of the Agincourt. Can you read? Still, I heard static, but there were bursts of clearer sound, too, just barely over the threshold of audibility. We were getting into the clear, and quickly. Twenty-five knots. Twenty-five-three. Almost too quickly. Hello, District of Columbia. This is Agincourt. Do you read? Over. Can you hear me? I looked up and back over my shoulder. Twenty-five-eight. Twenty-five-nine. Twenty-six knots. Fuck. The Leviathan wasn't pursuing us after all. It was moving back up. I fired up all of Agincourt's lights and thrusters and blew her ballasts. We began to climb. Lavelle! What? What is it? Any luck on the radio? None yet. Why? Leviathan's not moving after us. It's going up. Good. District will hit it when it gets close, then. It's not gonna get close. It's gonna come up right underneath the boat. Sub won't be able to attack at that range. There was a pause. Twenty-three knots now. We lost speed when we moved up. Twenty-three-one. Oh my god! Oh my god! Move! 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 God damn it! Move! Get us up there! Just keep trying to raise the ship. Twenty-five point four knots. 25-7. The massive shadow of the Leviathan was moving up into the brighter waters, and I could see its tentacles falling into line as it gained speed. Hello, hello, District of Columbia, this is Agincourt. Can you read me? Over. Respond. Respond. 27.3 knots, 3,000 feet below the surface, 2,000 roughly to the district's test depth. Agincourt continued her climb, and gradually as she did, the waters began to brighten, the pressure gauge began to fall, and the leviathan, now swimming fast far above and to the left of us, came closer into view. Only then did I understand fully, District of Columbia stood no chance, even in an unfair fight. This beast was unstoppable. Hello, hello, District of Columbia, this is Agincourt, can you read me? Over! 1,500 feet to the escort's test depth. Hello, in court. This is District Columbia. We're reading. Over. We're moving in. Listen to me. Listen to me. Ensign, we're telling you we do not have the Leviathan in tow. I repeat, we do not have the Leviathan in tow. It got between us and is heading for the coordinates I listed earlier. If you're there, you need to fall back immediately. Do you copy? Leave. Now. A thousand feet. Eight hundred. 750. Breaking up. Coordinates listed 3.4 by negative 150.45. Standing by package. Wait. Wait. District of Columbia, do you copy? This is Lieutenant Lavelle of the USS Agincourt. Are you there? Do you. <laughs> kicked up into my throat. I knew that sound. The roar of the Leviathan from the Tuscany tapes. 
clearly the beast had exhausted its usefulness for stealth. And that could only mean a single thing. Damn it. Lavelle joined me in the pilot sphere. Jesus, what the hell was that? We're too late, that's what it is. We're too fucking late. And we were. Although, Agincourt's current of speed swept us in closer before I pulled it to a full stop. It was a stop with a view, though. A helpless and terrible view. We saw the mountainous back of the Leviathan and its great maw covered with a shield wall of its writhing tentacles absorbing a series of torpedo charges from the escort sub. It discharged a flurry of Mark 48s from the pods. Those torpedoes left on rockets and detonated in waves. And for a fleeting moment, I thought it might be enough, if properly targeted, to turn back the Leviathan, or wound the damn thing, or something. But the beast took the hits and only crawled forward, and before long, the sub had only its ballistic arsenal, nothing appropriate for a fight like this. It began to throw its whole effort to a retreat, but an Ohio class as a hulking mammoth, two football fields in length and nearly 19,000 long tons of metal rivets. It is fast, but not fast enough. The District of Columbia was doomed. Try to raise Dixon Lavelle, I said, and my voice trembled when I did. District is dust. As I said it, the final torpedo in the Columbia's armament was launched. It sped through the water and trailed a skipping, spluttering wake, and hit a tentacle, and exploded tremendously, but fruitlessly, upon it. And then, after a moment of silence, the Leviathan unraveled itself, and its tentacles blocked out the last of the sunbeams at dusk, and they swirled and curled and wrapped their vastness around the hulk of the district. And then, the vessel was gone. God damn it! I pulled Agincourt away from the feasting with all speed. 20 knots. 20.1. 20.4. Hello, USS Dixon. Do you read? This is Lieutenant Lavelle of the Agincourt. Respond. Over. 22 knots. Hello, hello, Dixon. This is the USS Agincourt. Over. Requesting a pickup. Do you read? Over. 23. I felt a rumbling and shaking and a mighty displacement in the water behind us. Agincourt buckled and rolled. I looked behind me. 23-5. Hello, Dixon. This is Agincourt. Do you copy? Over. 23-6. Oh, God. The Leviathan had finished its meal and was turning around. Its tentacles alone forced a flood of riptide, and then, God almighty, there it was. The maw. It was big, hideously, monstrously, impossibly big. A yawning canyon and a mouth all the same. What the hell is this thing? 24.1 knots of speed. 24.6. Hello, Agincourt. This is the USS Dixon, responding to request for pickup. What's your heading? The Leviathan opened its eyes, and Agincourt was suddenly awash in an orange glow. Fuck. Lavelle! Hold on, Dixon. What? 26 knots. Cancel pickup. What? Why? 26-3. It sees us. Tell Dixon to get itself to safety. We'll try to shake this thing and rendezvous. 26-8. 27. Dixon, do you copy? Over. Loud and clear, Agincourt. 27-5. The Leviathan's tentacles flew into form behind it as it gave chase. Help us, please. Please, Jesus. 27-7. Listen to me. We are currently heading northwest with all speed. The USS District of Columbia has been destroyed. We- 27928. I'm sorry, say again, say again over. The Columbia is gone. Affirmative. The Leviathan has destroyed the USS District of Columbia. We are now- <laughs> Motherfucking. I gunned Agincourt's thrusters for all they were worth. They groaned and protested, but they did their job, if only just. 30 knots. 
30.2, 30.3, even if the ocean itself seemed to be draining into the thing's mouth by the lake load. Come on, baby, come on, come on, come on. Agincourt, this is Dixon Actual. Confirm destruction of District of Columbia, over. 32 knots. Yes, sir. The Leviathan took everything District had to throw at it, sir, and then it just ate the ship. 32-5. We've located your beacon, Agincourt. The destroyer group is moving into rescue and engage. My heart stopped. 33 knots. Lavelle! I know, I know. Dixon, are you there? Captain Gilsey, do not engage, sir. Do not engage. I promise you, sir, there is nothing short of a fucking nuke that can stop this thing. Get the destroyer group to safety and we will meet you there. Negative, Agincourt. You've brought the thing into the open. We'll handle it from here. Gilsey out. 34 knots and climbing. Dixon, respond. Over. <laughs> Agincourt flew admirably, but from the sound and from its own effort, it rumbled and it shook, and it swam against the might of the current. 34 7, 35. Come on, baby, come on. Dixon, this is Agincourt requesting you disengage immediately. Respond, respond, god damn it! The Leviathan was gaining, whether or not that meant it was moving swift or simply dragging the sea itself to its yawn was unclear and irrelevant. All I knew and all I cared to reverse was the fact that Agincourt was falling, despite a mighty effort to put distance between herself and her hunter. It was a race against time and all the odds. It was a race we were losing. 36 knots. 36 one. Dixon, this is Agincourt. Answer me, you fucking psychopaths! DISENGAGE! Every dial and needle and stick and lever rattled in their seats, and my eardrums shook, and upstairs I could hear Laville screaming in rage, and pounding the sides of the control desk with a wrench. Thirty-seven knots. Thirty-seven three. The closer the Leviathan got, the more speed we needed just to keep ourselves alive. It was like being caught by the pull of gravity on the edge of an event horizon. One wrong move, a single mistake, would doom us. I began to see the shadow of the maw creep over the ship. Agincourt was nearly at capacity now. 39 knots, and it wasn't enough. Agincourt to Dixon! Agincourt to Dixon! Do not engage! I rep- Lavelle paused when he heard the static. Once again, the mass of the Leviathan blocked our signal, and there was nothing we could do to stop it. The water rushed into the maw, and Agincourt went with it, tumbling helplessly and desperately, and with its thrusters flaring with all their strength of arms and all their force. Latner? Or- The force of the explosion from an anti-submarine ship-to-ship missile, undoubtedly, expanded through the sea and seemed to set the whole ocean ablaze. The Dixon had arrived. Another explosion went off, and it shook our ship to the core, and the Leviathan rerouted its course for the surface with demonic speed. Behind us, by not more than a few hundred feet, we felt its mass as it moved. Undersea waves were unleashed, then enveloped and consumed the Agincourt, and sent her tumbling ballast to ballast and left her nearly belly up in the water before she rolled around again. The explosions were getting closer. Lavelle, don't they know we're down here? I don't know. They might have lost our beacon with the radio signal. What does that mean? It means they think we're fucking dead. Can you try to raise them again? I don't know, I'll- There was a mighty flash of light, and then- The explosions were no further off than before the last one, but my ears struggled now to report them properly. Everything was muffled, everything swam, my head, my vision. I fumbled at the controls and found half unresponsive and the others blaring. What? Lavelle! I heard myself shout. 
Lavelle, can you raise the Dixon? I kept fumbling over the controls. Dials and readouts and panels were in their off state. I tried boosting the thrusters, but heard only the click-click clicking of the control in its set. Lavelle, you there? I could hear my own heart more so than the battle. Lavelle! And gradually the shock began to fade, and when it did, it gave way to something worse. Fear. Lavelle! I ran from the control set to the hatch ladder and looked up. A droplet of water hit me in the eye. Then another. And another. I started to climb. As my hand hit the top rung, it slipped on fluid. But I grabbed it tighter and pulled myself up into the operation center below the hatch. Lavelle? There was no response. Of course there was no response. Lavelle was sitting at an unnatural angle against the far wall. And his eyes were still shut, and a bit of blood pooled from his right ear and down onto his shoulder, where it was washed away by a steady trickle of seawater from the bent hatch that became a stream that became several. The lights flickered again. I reached my friend and knelt down next to him in the water. Lavelle, hey, buddy, hey, can you hear me? I heard not but the slightest, quietest whimper but it was drowned out by other sounds quickly. The roar of the beast. And then one far more ominous, even than that. I heard rushing water from down below. When I looked over the edge, I saw the ocean inside the pilot sphere, and it was rising to meet me, but I could only see it from a sunbeam that struck through the hatch. I grabbed a wrench. Lavelle, we're at the surface. I can see the sun. It's right there, buddy. That's home. Just sit tight, okay? I climbed up two more rungs on the ladder and swung at the hatch with a wrench. It bent up ever so slightly. I swung again. An inch of progress. The water crested the threshold of the operations room. Lavelle whimpered. Hang in there, buddy, okay? I swung up again. The lights shut off for a final time. Agincourt tumbled and groaned as she died. Come on, please, Jesus, please, God. The hatch began to bend a bit more. The sunlight brightened and the water from below now had reached the midpoint of Lavelle's upturned service boots. I felt a release. Got it. I had forced a hole in the hatch big enough to put a hand through. But then water dumped inside at twice the rate of the surge from below. I turned my head and slid down the ladder and stumbled back as it began to pool up. What the? I looked up from the hole and only once I did, did I realize the mistake. We weren't at the surface. We were merely close to it. Not more than a hundred feet away, but many, many feet too far. Water flooded the operations room from both ends and washed me up against the wall next to Lavelle. The ocean threw itself to our beating and it pounded us in waves and torrents and buckets. I couldn't breathe for seconds at a time, but I grabbed Lavelle's hand and he squeezed with all the strength he had, just enough to bend his fingertips around the side of my palm, and then we began to float up to the ceiling. I'm sorry buddy, I'm really, really, really sorry. I tried. I heard no more explosions from the battle not far off, just the triumphant roar of the leviathan and the rush of water and my own ragged heaving, shaking breaths. I pressed my lips to the ceiling and sucked in all the air that was there to breathe, and then I could feel Lavelle slip beneath the surface, and the water tightened up around my chest, and then it was over my face. Then a shadow fell over the hulking bones of the Agincourt's hull, and I felt a slamming impact and a rush, and then...
they're inside. I opened my eyes up. They hurt, and I didn't know where I was. I didn't know when it was. I knew nothing at all, in fact, but I heard footsteps and saw a shadow. And then I felt something grab my shoulders and hoist me up. A bucket's worth of seawater fell from my shirt, hair, and face. <sighs> You're okay. You're okay. Um, Lieutenant Latner, is it? Hey, come here. It's okay. We're gonna get you out of here, okay? Ensign, tell the end we've got a survivor. Yes, yes sir. sir. I don't... I don't know what... It's okay. Lavelle. What's that? Lavelle. <laughs> I don't remember. I can't... I started crying in pitiful, racking, heaving, messy sobs. Hey, hey, it's okay, it's okay. Can someone help me out here? And then I started to slip. Hey, I I'm losing him. I'm losing him. And then everything went black. I woke up in a hospital bed. For more than a day, I was delirious. But once I came to, I was filled in, as I, in turn, was able to recall my story for a report. From what I was told, the following had happened. The Dixon had been destroyed, lost with all hands, along with its escorts and, and of course, the District of Columbia. All told, the Navy lost more than 700 good men in the operation. Among them was a lieutenant named David Scott Lavelle, in the deadliest day in the history of the Navy at peacetime. But I learned something else as well. Based on the impact mark along the Agincourt's wrecked hull, it is evident that after feasting on the Dixon, the Leviathan hit Agincourt and knocked her clear to the surface, where another ship, the Arla Burke destroyer, Tecumseh, found her rolling in the surf with a broken hatch. The Navy will undoubtedly make an effort to cover up this story and explain away their losses as a disastrous training failure. But I'll have no part of that, nor any further efforts to hunt down the Leviathan. No, this story needs to be told, for those lost men, and for Lavelle, and for you. Like the pilot of Tuscany before me, I've accepted the fact that that thing down there should not be disturbed, and neither should its home. For the love of God himself, do not venture far into the deep, deep pit of the wild Pacific, for all our sakes. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I can't express how much I enjoyed this, and I hope that you guys did too. Huge thank you to Mother Creepypasta for narrating, and to Immunity Zero who joined us for part 2. I've linked their channels on the end screen, and in the description so please check them out and show them some love. They really, really deserve it. As always, if you enjoyed the video, please violently smash that like button and subscribe, or a newly freed emancipated zombie will protest near your door. Psst, if you didn't get it, it's because you haven't seen the camping compilation video. But anyway, for now guys I'm going to sign off and get some rest. Stay awesome, and thank you so much for your support. It really does mean the world to me. And I'll see you in the next one.